do you notice um, a kind of, uh, how can I say, diffidence or distrust by some people towards immersive experiences? Do you think that there's, a, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. What are the prejudices about immersion? Well, I, th I think we've always had this kind of love-hate relationship with the idea. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I call it fear of fiction. Uh, you know, it, on the one hand, we want to be immersed, we want to lose ourselves in some story, in some experience, in play, um, and yet, at the same time, some of us, at least, are really made nervous by that. It's, uh, it's a scary prospect because it involves um, a, a loss of control, um, it involves, you know, breaking down the boundaries between reality and fiction, and um, that's, uh, that's very nervous-making. Mm -hmm. But do you think also that it, it feels like a, too much of a playful experience for some serious matters sometimes? <laughs> that, that can certainly be that the That kind case of prejudice well. yeah. can happen yeah. too, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right? Did you experience the same? Um, no, no. I, I, think, I think that, like I said, like we are kind of trained in ways that make us able to understand intuitively what these things are. Um, you brought up the question of policy. Yeah, I think, I think this, for example, can impact policy, but I think it, it begins to be interesting when, um, when the idea of participatory democracy becomes a real basis for this kind of thought process. So rather than, for example, um, you know, showing a congressman that something that they're doing is horrible, um, empowering, and, and this is something I'm actually working on right now with a, with a company that, that makes uh, data available on various politicians that are out there, is, is actually throwing that data back at the public and having them kind of construct a narrative around that. And I think, so we know that. We know that instinctively. We want to walk up to our congressman's office and wag our fingers and tell him something. But how else can we do that in a way that is workable in this day and age and actually makes use of the tools that are out there? I think we know instinctively how. It's just that once we uh, introduce the, the device, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, a, a little bit disruptive, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's really a very short step to where people embrace it, I think. I mean, just based on Facebook, you can figure it. One thing that I wanted to ask you is, um, Aina, you were talking about the space, the importance of the space and how the space gets chosen. And I find it also interesting that as a platform to uh, make presentations, you choose Prezi, which is all about you know, moving around in the same space. Um, but I'm wondering how you keep people in the space. You know, that's one of the most important and challenging um, um, things in transmedia is how to keep the attention, how to keep people engaged, and how to um, let them choose their own path while at the same time, you know, it's about lack of control, but at the same time, a lot of instigation and a lot of stimulus. So how do you make that happen? Lance, do you have any particular way well, to go about it? I, I think it's a lot of it's experimentation. I think a, the biggest problems that exist right now is the fragmentation of the form and the lack of infrastructure. Right. So a lot of the times the technology is so visible that it becomes a barrier to entry. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And then I think there's another side that's all really about the digital literacy of it and understanding um, how you can tell stories with it or how you can make somebody feel something through it. Because uh, you know the moments that, um, at least in the work, that I've done when, when you can actually make somebody feel something and they forget. I worked on a project called Bear 71. Yeah, that, yeah, Bear 71 is wonderful. Yeah. That was a really interesting project about a, a bear that was tagged when she was three and then when she was 11 died on the tracks with her, her cub uh, in Banff, Canada. And one thing, we brought it into a live uh, environment. It's a really kind of beautiful project. And um, the, just people being brought to tears by something that was interactive, you know, was really powerful, you know, seeing them respond to it in a way and hearing the music and then their feelings about it. So I think like when you can find that emotional resonance within something, you know, like I'm always trying to, to go there and, and, and I like the challenge of the fragmentation of the landscape. For me, the term, when the term immersion became really discussed a lot in the 90s, was around new media, and at the same time people started to talk about another term, which is interaction, right? And interaction. I think, and I think people touched this, but what I'm wondering if any of your participants have more to say about how do we see connections or not between these two different terms, right? Do you want to say uh, something? You know, is it perpendicular, is it parallel, yeah. any connection? Interaction, not in a cognitive sense, but in a kind of, in a kind of more technological sense. Yeah, you know, I think that it, it's, it's really interesting and, and, and clearly we're 
evolving a new a new grammar of storytelling, and it's exactly what Lance and I are, are are doing now. Um, but one of the things that is uh, uh, that that's that's happening is that it's hard to tell sometimes whether something is going to be a distraction or whether it's going to you know to to increase the immersiveness Partic particularly uh you know something that's participatory it's like the you know the tweets that i talked about uh, that the harmony institute researched um for for the walking dead uh you know there there are times when the so-called second screen experience you know you're sharing stuff on one screen while watching tv um uh feels immersive but there are other times when it can you know not be not seem immersive at all when it can seem much more like an interruption and um, i i think that's the kind of thing that we're just starting to sort out as i was preparing for this salon um i know i was th thinking a lot how we're borderline um touching the realm of games and of play not of games but of play so can you build more uh, on what you declared, on the statement that you made at the end of your, um, of your presentation, which is we are in the age of play? Well, I, I, think, I think that um, to, to, I really had to pull the camera back, so to speak, to, to address this as play. Because what, what I think is happening is that we are already playing. I don't, I don't know if any one of you were, uh, if, if anyone uses this, don't be ashamed. It's called Tinder. Um, <laughs> Tinder is a dating app. I know what it you, is. If yeah. you have a teenager or you are close to being a teenager, you are definitely using it. Um, all, all you need to know to know if someone's using it is are they thumbing to the left, thumbing to the right, thumbing to the left, <laughs> thumbing to the right. Now, this is really weird because unlike other dating experiences, which is like, I want to find a date and then go on one. It's not like that. It's I want to sit here and I want to spend hours and hours and hours in physical space trying to figure out who I might connect with and it, this is how it works. Yes, one way, no, the other way. So when a match is made, then you guys connect and then you can have a chat, right? So it's like this completely immersive, truthfully immersive experience. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so, um, it feels or seems so, so meaningless in a way, but it isn't. So then the question becomes, if I'm already playing with everything in sight, I'm playing constantly. The, the iPhone is just like this, this trove of like play stuff, right? Like candy that you're constantly eating. Then the question really becomes like, if this mechanism of play is just kind of like almost enveloping us, then how can we actually just take from kind of a landscape that's already quite developed and it's like growing really, really fast in all the different ways. You see, you've seen probably the videos of two-year-olds who walk up to a regular television yeah, and try yeah. to make it do oh, things yeah. oh, that yeah. the iPhone or the iPad does. So there is already kind of like this innate right. desire to play with this stuff. And so then the real thing becomes, can we advance that in not, a way, not in a way that solely serves commerce and technological development, but which serves what I like to think of as a higher purpose, which is how can we do it more beautifully, better, more seamlessly, pull the technology away, and let the idea surface. That really becomes the challenge of the yeah. times. And making technology disappear always is. Did you want to say well, something, Deb? Well, um, you know, I'm sorry to sound like so um, 20th century, because in fact, my title has digital in it, but um, the, <laughs> the, uh, in the museum environment, the flip side is we have this tension between wanting to be almost like the James Terrell low stim immersion and have a chance to be with these beautiful artworks. And in fact, Andrew, who was overwhelmed by his experience when I said, you know, we're developing a new handheld. What do you think it could have on it? He's like, I don't want a handheld. The handheld's <laughs> not going to help. I want it to just happened to me. I just want it to be there, part of the environment. He didn't want the technology, and he's very tech-minded. So I, we were thinking about it. It's a very weird tension, because we understand all of this fantastic thing that's going on. What do we bring in the museum as a separate space? My hope is that the artists will actually come in and start creating experiences so that as an educator, I don't have to figure out how I intervene between the art 
and the audience, but that it's the artist that will just be doing it directly with well, But I don't the think audience. they are glorifying technology at all. No, I think I'm not saying it's glorifying. It's just like it's tricky because right. if people are now expecting, if this is the well, way to create the... So, so the road people normally take, and what I'll hear when I'm doing uh, com you know, more commercial work, is people will say, can you make a Tinder for blank? Just fill in the blank. So like, can you make a Tinder for the museum experience? So I can pick, do I want to see a Liechtenstein? <laughs> you gotta like decide how you want to go, right? So, uh -huh. so the idea is not to like impose that rule onto any experience and expect it to work because one has to accept that the Tinder experience was probably created to make money. Like that was the primary thing. So when we, when we buy into that belief system, we just become kind of like drones. Like we're just basically using what is out there, that behaviors that is out there. So when I say like, I, I really want your, you know, your, your, the people that you deal with in, in museum education to actually have an awesome experience. And it may be nothing like Tinder, but the fact is that they're used to a certain kind of behavior might prepare them for something that may be a little more deep, I would hope. Hi, I'm Adam Harvey, and a designer working with privacy. Um, excuse me for taking the front row seat, but I'm happily immersed down here. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, reducing experiences with privacy. <clears throat> And my question about immersion is, I think people think about it as an additive experience, um, where you're adding value to something by making it immersive. You know, rather than removing that and making it more valuable by um, reducing it, kind of like John Maida would say about design. So I'm wondering if it's a, a problem in the way that we're talking about it as an immersive experience that needs more rather than less. Anybody wants to say something here? Um, I, I was experimenting with this idea of scarcity. I, I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of write, write. I've been asked a bunch about uh, the way that I was designing stuff, and I thought, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to write. I'm going to write like this book, and I'm going to write it all in 140 characters or less. And each page, like it's 140 copies of the book. There's 140 characters, and there's 140 pages, and it's 140 bucks, right? And anybody can buy one if they want. Um, but, but the thing that was interesting to me was that idea of the scarcity of it. And you see it with um, oh, uh, uh, what, uh, Jonathan Harris's new work, you know, where it's all about like, Albert? only. Yeah. No, 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 the new the one, one about the, the, oh, the, one about pornography, the, porn, the pornography. Where it's like limited and only a certain amount of people can be there at a certain given time. Yeah, that's and, really interesting. And so when I did this book, I, I made it so it's 140 physical copies, but every page says, you know, please set this book free and retweet. You know, because I was interested in that idea of scarcity right. and that interested in how it amplifies out. So I think, um, I think there's something really cool about what you're saying in terms of like dialing back the immersion. It's kind of like when I write scenes, you're, you're trying to find the right rhythm for it. You're trying to find the right way to engage the audience and where the emotion comes in and the characters and the arc. And I think uh, immersion falls prey to a lot of gimmicks. It falls prey to a lot of you know, people thinking the more they throw at it, the, it'll solve the problems. And, and, then, and then it just, for, you know, it just makes it a really cluttered mess. I wanted to close the loop and, and show that there's lots of possibilities here, not, not only related to the future, but also to retelling the past in a more effective way using the language of today and reaching people the way that is most effective today. Um, you know, I, I know that there were more questions, but we're beyond the normal time, but you know that we still have two hours of available time out here to have drinks and talk more. So if you do not mind, I'm going to set our speakers free in case they have to run back home to five-year-olds or anything <laughs> else. And I, I want to really thank Ina, Lance, Deb, and Frank. You've been fantastic. And I want to thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.